There is a habitation built by the living God for all of every nation who seeks and reigns of old. O Zion, Zion, I long thy gates to see. to our services here at Central. We appreciate very much your presence this morning. And if you are a guest with us, we encourage you to fill out one of the white cards on the back of the pew in front of you. Leave that in your seat, and then we'll pick that up when we are dismissed this morning. We'll have a few announcements to uh, make mention of uh, at the close of the service. So we ask you just to stay around just for a moment when we do that. At this time, we'll enter into our worship service. In Matthew 28, 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It may be in the valley where countless dangers hide. It may be in the sunshine that I am peace of Oh. 
Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God.
most gracious and heavenly Father. We thank you, Lord, for this day that we can be here to sing praises to your name, study thy word, learn from the message that Cliff will bring us, and apply it to our lives daily, Lord. We ask that you be with Cliff this morning as he brings us the message. We're so thankful for him and his family. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the elders that work so hard tending the flock, Lord. We thank you for them and all that they do. Father, we thank you for the rain that we get occasionally. We thank you, Lord, for the sunshine. Father, we so thankful, Lord, for the first responders that tend to us when we need their help, Lord. The police, the fire department, the paramedics, the doctors and the nurses, all of them, Lord, we couldn't do without them. So glad that you have provided them for us. Father, we're so thankful for your son, Lord, that so willing to go to the cross and, and die and give his life so that we may have salvation and one day dwell with thee. Father, it's a, another beautiful day. Father, we ask for your help in establishing peace here in this country and in this world, Lord, for the fighting that goes on in this world, Lord. We ask that an end can come to it in a peaceful resolution. Father, we pray for our government, Lord, that they can get back on track and be the government that they need to be work together to resolve our issues and put us back into a strong nation that we once were. Father, we just pray, Lord, for those that, that are ailing at this time and are not with us. Pray for those that are not with us and for whatever reason, Lord, but those that are sick, Lord, we ask your blessings to be upon each and every one of them. Pray for those that have lost loved ones, Lord. We ask for your comfort to them, Lord. Be with them, steady them, and love them. It's for these things we pray in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Does everybody have the emblems for us to take the Lord's Supper? Anybody lacking? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Why did my Savior come to earth?
For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that the world could be saved. From the beginning of time, it was God's plan. He told Satan in the Garden of Eden, You'll bruise his heel, but he'll bruise your head. Years later, Christ went to the cross. He was put to death. He was beaten for us. Spat upon. Had his side pierced. All part of God's plan for us. For a love so intense that he gave his only begotten son. Foolishness of God. Man doesn't understand it. But we as Christians do. We meet upon the first day of week of the week to bring to remembrance what our Lord did for us. He gave himself for us, the perfect sacrifice. His body represented by the bread. It was so savagely beaten. His blood represented by the fruit of the vine. And through that blood, we're saved. Will you bow with me as we go give thanks to the bread? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us and your son's willingness to go to the cross for us. To be that perfect sacrifice where the, the blood of bulls and goats couldn't do it. Your son willingly came to the cross. His broken body for us, which represented by the bread we're about to partake. We ask you to bless it and bless those who are about to partake, Lord. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Bow with me again, please. Gracious Heavenly Father, again we come to you in prayer, thanking you for your love for us and your Son's love for us. We ask you to bless this fruit of the vine, which represents your Son's blood, shed on the cross for us, that cleansing blood. We ask you to bless those who are about to partake. We ask you to bless the cup. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. With the Lord's Supper now being completed, we have opportunity to give back if we've been prospered. Will you bow with me, please? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this country that, live, that we live in, for the opportunities that we have, for the monies that we make. We know all these things belong to you. We were stewards of these things. We ask to bless those that give cheerfully to the work of the church to spread your gospel. We ask to bless them and guide them, Lord. These things rest in Christ's name. Amen. John chapter 8 and verse 12, then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but
but have the light of life. If you're able, we ask you to please stand as we sing this song. <clears throat> I have decided. delighted that David and his family are able to go to polish in the pulpit. This has been a very strengthening and encouraging work that brethren have put on for a number of years and he'll be back with us uh, at the end of the week. So I'm going to be filling in for him today and um, I'm tempted to tell you the story about a herd when one uh, preacher said that he was going to be a fill-in, and um, he said, you know, a fill-in is a substitute, and uh, when he got done, one of the good sisters greeted him at the back, and she said, you were no substitute, you were the real pain. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I agree with her, but uh, that was her conclusion anyway, but we're going to look at great decisions of the Bible. And I would like for you to, to turn, if you would, to Joshua 24 and uh, verse number uh, 15, because in this, Joshua sets forth uh, a choice, a decision that had to be made. And I appreciate so much James leading that last song that he did, I have decided. Our following Jesus is based upon a decision. It is this decision that we had to make. And hopefully that we have made it and that we've been faithful to that decision. But it is a decision nonetheless. And Joshua 24, 15, And if it seem evil unto you, unto whom you serve, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which, were on the, which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Very, very important as it is that uh, these decisions must be made. And one of the greatest decisions started with by your choosing to be here this day, to be in the house of the Lord, to come together with those of like precious faith and for those that have obeyed the gospel to be strengthened and encouraged and nourished in that wholesome faith. 
But if you're here today, my friend, and you're not a member of the body of Christ, we are mindful of you as well. And we hope that it will be your decision by the end of this sermon that you will want to choose to obey the Lord as well, because that's what God wants all of us to do. I want us to look at some decisions, and some of these decisions are going to be good decisions, and some of them are going to not be quite so good. But it'll be important for us to evaluate both kinds so that we know what we need to avoid and what we need to embrace. In regards to Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve were given a choice. God said that he created them there and that they were not to eat of a particular tree that was in the midst of that garden. All the rest was theirs. They could eat, partake of it. But the one, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they were not to eat, neither were they to touch. So the, the instruction seems to be fairly simply and, and true that, that, you know, either eat the tree or not eat the tree to suffer the consequences or not to suffer the consequences. What Adam and Eve did that day was the influence of Satan was much stronger than that of God. Why? Was it because the Lord, the Lord spoke in a soft voice and the devil in a very commanding voice? No. Was it because they didn't understand what the Lord really would want them to do and they did what Satan was wanting them to do? No, that wasn't the case. The case was that they heard both, but one resonated louder than the other. And so they f chose to follow the serpent. Well, there would be consequences that associated with that. Life for man began at this very point with decisions, and it will always be that way all through life. There will have to be those decisions. And so man has to make uh, what God has asked them to do. They're going to have to make those serious. They're going to have to make those tough decisions. Am I going to choose to serve family or am I going to choose to serve God? Not that one's not serving God, but when serving family, that's not necessarily the case. But when the family suggests that we would like to go here or do this or that or take one away from service or not to be involved because of involvement. You know, we're, we're thankful for the school systems. They've started back up. And so our teachers and students are back in school. And in the school year, there are so many activities that go take place that pull between the bowstrings of the heart to be involved with this and that. And we want our children to be involved. It's very important. It's very important for their mental growth and physical growth as well to be involved. But sometimes there will be those things that will want to take them away from services, away from Bible study. And so it's a very tough decision that one is going to have to make. And Adam and Eve made a wrong decision. And that wrong decision was based upon the fact that they were influenced by human appetite. And this human appetite was a, de a desire that they would be wise. They would be wiser than anyone that had ever faced the grace, the face of this earth. When we think about that, that's still a great temptation today in many realms, in many circles of being the wisest, Genesis 3 and verse 6, because they wanted that from a human standpoint, not because it would give them an advantage in serving God, not because it would give them the opportunities to draw closer to God, but because of human appetites, which was involved. And so the consequences that uh, Adam and Eve, the choices that they made, we still uh, suffer the consequences. Those consequences are still with us today. And that's exactly what Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians uh, 15 and verse 22. 
we suffer the consequences of wrong doing, of wrong choices that was made, just as Adam and Eve had done in the garden long ago. Our decision, we, we need to recognize, our decision may affect many generations yet to be born. The decision that you and I make today the decision that we encourage our children to make today is going to live on and going to influence countless generations from time to come. But I suggest to you in the second place that there is that decision that Abraham faced. Abraham, we know, has been called a friend of God. And the reason that he's referred to as a friend of God is because in Genesis 22, verses 1 through 13, he made a choice. And that choice was an unhesitantly choice. He was going to do what the Lord wanted him to do regardless of the consequences. Regardless of whether some thought that to be really fashionable or not whether it would be the in thing as far as uh, inroads would go. Now, some people would see this as a, a violent step, that this would be a step away from, but actually it is a violent step only in the sense that it was contrary to human judgment. Why would one want to uh, go and offer his son, his only son, upon a cross? To show you the confidence that Abraham had, when the, the, the lad said to his dad as they were on their way, he said, uh, Father, what, is, what are we going to be sacrificing? Abraham, in his wisdom, said, God will provide. God will provide. Now, Abraham knew in his heart exactly what God had asked him to go do. And Abraham had full intentions of going, of building the altar, and offering his son upon that altar. But he knew that God was going to provide. Maybe it was deep down that Abraham knew that God didn't really uh, require any human sacrifice other than for sin, and that was the Christ. That's the only other time that is ever related in the human sense. So maybe Abraham realized that that was not going to be the case. But whatever it was, he pointed it all back to God. And he says, God will provide. So this may seem a violent step, but only as a man would think of it in such a way. It was a step that was required Faith, faith that was rooted and grounded in Jehovah God. One that would, would, no matter what was required, would be obeyed. And in Hebrews 11, verses 17 through 19, the Bible speaks of Abraham's faith just that way. He believed God. And it was counted unto him for righteousness' sake. So we think about the great choice that Abraham made, and we would certainly encourage others to make a choice with Abraham as well. But how about Lot? Remember the, the story about Lot? We're told that, uh, that Lot was given a choice, and that was that uh, because Abraham had pleaded and there couldn't be the righteous found in the city, that they were to flee that city. And you remember what happened to Lot? He looked back. There was something that about there, and it was no doubt other ones that he knew, maybe other friends, loved ones, Something of, some, uh, of something caught his attention, and he wanted to look back. But when his wife did, 
and his wife looked back, not Abraham, uh, or not Lot. She turned into a pillar of salt. You know, through these years, they have been giving tours over there. And one of the things, when you go into this area, you'll bring back a little piece of salt. Well, I suspect that she had been literally given away long, long ago. But that's, anyway, that's one of the tokens that is associated with, with Lot's wife as she made this choice to look back. And the consequences, if we could only sometimes see the consequences that we're going to put ourselves in when we make such a choice as that. For example, notice something, if you will. His decision led to the demise of his family. He lost his family all because of his decision. So I, after the thought, we asked Lot, Lot, was that such a, a wise choice? Lot would probably answer in a different than the way he did. His decision was because it led up to the demise of his family. They were gone, lost. Genesis 19, 1 through 26 will set the stage for you. You know what? It very well may have been because the grass looks greener on the other side of the fence. But friends, when the grass looks greener on the other side of the fence, you can know they've got a higher water bill. So it's not always that which appears in the But isn't that the idea? Things always look better from maybe where we're standing than, than where, what they really are. But he allowed, my friends, he allowed the grass, or he allowed the material things to influence him. And to show you how strong it was, look at the outcome of what had happened. Choosing the wild-watered plains of the Jordan rather than the other choices that he made was given. And he chose the well-watered plains. Some things, uh, sometimes things aren't all as they seem to be. And so we need to take into consideration maybe more thought than that. Let's look at another case. And this is in the case regarding Moses. We understand that Moses is upheld in the Bible as a tremendous Bible character. And there's good reason for that. Notice, if you will, in Hebrews 11, 24 and 25, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Those words, we really need to allow them to, to, to really sink deep in. Notice this. Moses refused. His refusal was that he was choosing rather to suffer affliction to do what God had called him to do than to enjoy the pleasures and all that Egypt had to offer. You remember the, the herbs and all of the things that it was enjoyable there? No, he chose rather to suffer with the people of God than to enjoy that. And notice, how long does it last? Most choices in this life are such fleeting choices. We choose them, we enjoy, we indulge in them, and they're gone. But the consequences linger on and on and on and on, even to affect numerous generations yet to come. But I want you to notice some things about Moses. He cho his choice in Hebrews eleven twenty four, as we mentioned here, he chose rather to refuse 
Now, he could have, he could have accepted and be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and go on and live and dwell in luxury and peace and ease and say, well, my soul has done well. I'll just take my ease and, and let all, everything rest as it may. No, that wasn't Moses. He couldn't do that. He refused because he knew that wasn't the right course. He knew that wasn't really deep down in his heart what he was all about. He knew that. Sometimes we can become our own best friends. When we cherish the word of God and we treasure it in our heart, and then we live true to what we believe in our heart. Sometimes we can be our own worst enemies by not choosing what ought to be the case and just by going with the flow. Moses could not do that. He would not allow that. He had much to give up. Uh, why did he do it? Because he saw a number of things. That is, he would not allow a false statement be said about him. Was he Pharaoh's daughter? Was he a child of Pharaoh's daughter? No. And he knew that. Is it possible that that might just have a little bit of influence, a little bit of sway upon what he was going to be doing in Egypt? Yeah, no doubt. Abraham's, or Moses says, I can't accept this. I can't let this be the choice. That's not what I'm all about. I want to serve God. And so he refused that choice and that he might be the kind of leader, the kind of man that God could call at a time like this to lead this great body of people back over into their homeland. What a choice Moses made. It's a choice we can make as well. We have the same opportunity. Now, I want you to notice some things. His choice, uh, what it grew out of, it didn't come from without, but it came from within him. It was that which Moses had made a, a respect to. That's what he lived for. You know, many times people have, uh, because of the things that they, they, they project something that they're really not. They're trying to live a, a, a life or present an image that really doesn't depict them and falter. But this came from deep within Moses. It came from his heart. The tables of his heart was, yes, Lord, I will follow thee. But I want you to notice that he had respect uh, for something, and that respect was in verse 26, that uh, he had respect for the recompense of the reward. He knew what the reward would be. If you do this, Moses, here's what I'm going to do. If you don't do this, then you're not going to receive that. It was directly tied together and associated in this very way. And Moses saw that. And so when that motivated him, it helped him to elevate the respect that he had within himself. But I want you to notice something else. Because he saw him, Hebrews eleven twenty seven. what actually transpired was Moses had a glimpse of the eternal. Can you imagine that? I can't imagine what Paul experienced when he said he knew a man uh, in 2 Corinthians who was caught up into the third heavens and he said when he came back he wasn't able to tell about those things. Nobody has. 
You know, I, I find it interesting of all the stories and all the accounts that can be given of events that people experience in life. God doesn't cause them to remember those if they did have an experience of something that was different. God's not going to allow us uh, to view glimpses of heaven in an out-of-body experience and come back and tell about it. He wouldn't even allow that in the case of Moses. But I want you to notice that glimpse of the unseen that Moses had settled it for him. It solidified his faith. It caused him to know that it was right and it could not be wrong. And sometimes we need that kind of conviction to know that the decision that we've made is right and that it cannot possibly be wrong. That this is what God wants us to do. Let's look on. And we next look to a man that we know as Naaman. Many things that we know about Naaman, but there's a few things that um, is emphasized. And uh, Naaman, of course, found in 2 Kings chapter 5, and he offers four reasons for why he wouldn't go down to the Jordan River and dip himself seven times so that he could be cleansed. That's what the prophet had told him to do. And he sent word by one of his servants. Now, Naaman had a wounded pride. Now, here's why. That wounded pride was because the prophet didn't come and speak to him directly. He sent his servant. Why don't I demand to at least be confronted with the prophet himself? No, secondly, he had a preconceived idea. He Behold, I thought I could do this and I could do that. You know, that has become sermon material for many a sermons. Behold, I thought. Many a times we may think that something be right. It just seems to be the, the thing to do and whatever. But it's what I thought. It's not what God thought. It's not what God told me to do. It's not what he, he wanted me to do. Behold, I thought. That was a preconceived idea that he had. And number three, notice the prejudice. He says, listen, he said, the rivers of Abana and Parfar are right here in the Damascus area. Why should I leave them and go all the way down to the Jordan in its muddy waters and there dip myself seven times? He said, that doesn't even make good sense because he thought within himself. It wasn't what, what God says, well, you reason this out. God says, here's what you're going to do. If you want to be cleansed, go dip seven times in the river Jordan. Yet, the prejudice was, there's water right here that's just as good. In fact, it's better, pure, than having to make that trip, that kind of a journey. But notice, last of all, he made the right decision by overcoming the obstacles that he faced within his own life. It's never too late to back up and say, you know, I didn't make always the right choice. That's not always been the, the best choice I could have made. And back up however far as necessary so we can correct it and we can move on. That builds character. That doesn't mean that you're weak and you're flimsy and you're tossed to and fro. No, it means that you're settled and you're fastened to that solid rock, which rock is being Christ. And so, chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. Here was Naaman, eventually who was cleansed by going as the prophet had told him to do, go to the Jordan River, dip yourself seven times. I can just imagine some being on the, on the sidelines there in the banks with a counter saying, once, 
Oh, he's still leprous twice. Two, three, four, five, six. He took that seventh time. Why? Because that's what the word of God said. That's what he was told to do. And he had to obey. Naaman came to his senses and did obey. Now, the last one I want us to look at this morning is that of Christ. Christ was made, uh, was given a number of choices all throughout his life. But I want you to notice those that uh, he was confronted with. Turn with me, if you will, into Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, we have the temptation of Christ, where the devil cometh to him and, and uh, takes him up into this mountain setting, and there he, he presents three basic propositions. Friends, please listen to me. Those three propositions are still with us today. Young people, when you are presented with choices, you're going to be presented with these very three same propositions. Okay? Temptations are always going to follow in this group of three. First of all, Satan said, if, if, if you be the Christ, he said, uh, turn these stones into bread. Well, you have the power to do that. You're the Christ. He didn't deny that. But was that what was important? I'm going to come back and say some summary things about this in just a moment. Let's look at the other two. He says, if you are the Christ, he says, cast yourself down. And the angels will come and they'll pick you up and, and you'll be all right. Third proposition was, if you are Christ, fall down and worship me and all of this vast kingdom. When they went up to the mountainside, don't you know all that they could see in any direction? Satan says, if you will bow down and worship me, he said, all of this I'm going to give to you. It's yours. As though it was his to belong with. It's easy to give something away that doesn't belong to us, doesn't, isn't it? I can give other people's money away. When it comes to mine, not so much. It's easy to give other people's time. When it comes to my time, well, let me think about that. Easy to do, isn't it? And Satan says, if you'll just bow down and worship me, he said, I'll give you all of these things. You know what, friends? The next statement is what is so colossal, which is so resounds throughout the world of the land even today. The Bible says it is written Literally, that means it stands written, it's been written, God has fixed that word in heaven, and it's been revealed to earth, it stands written. And you know what that highlights? Oh, the power of the scriptures. No wonder Christ could, could meet the wiles of the devil. He could meet Satan. And he could overcome them because he knew that Satan had an inferior book. That he had access to the divine one. And friends, when we make the choice that we're going to allow those scriptures to become just that important to us, then we're going to be able to say, it stands written. This is what I will do. Here's why I will do it. Here's how long I will do it. And here's the reason why is it will bring glory unto God. I hope you could see these great decisions of the Bible. Some were decisions that man made that weren't always so, turned out so good. There were others that were monumental in what they resolved. But Christ invites us to do these things. Come unto him, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, 
and take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden it is light. It can be easy if we fix our mind that whatever God wants me to do, that will I do. That becomes easy, becomes a no-brainer. We don't even have to think about it. I didn't have to say to myself, now, are you going to get up this morning? Are you going to prepare yourself? And are you going to go to Bible study? And are you going to go worship God? That was a decision that I've made well over 50 years ago, and I've never regretted it since. And so the Lord called. In Revelation 3 and verse 20, we have a picture where the Lord is standing at the door and he's knocking. But the handle is on the inside. He says, if any man will open the door and let me come into him, I will sup with him and he with me. But if any man, that's you, that's me. That's the, the handle is on our side. Are we going to open the door to him? That's what he desires for us. Now, friends, that necessitates a decision. Just as we've talked about, that there's no alternatives. And may I just, perhaps someone who might be thinking, well, maybe one excuse Excuses are just that. They're not acceptable. They never will be acceptable. They are completely useless, Luke uh, 14, 16 through 24. And so the matter is, friends, here are great decisions before us. Are we going to imitate them? Are we going to allow them to be the things that motivate us so that we can prepare not only for the kingdom here, but be received by him in glory when we quit the walks of life. By hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized for the remission of your sins, you can be lowered in that watery grave of baptism. He'll wipe your slate clean. You'll be raised a new Christian, a new creature in Christ. And if you will take up your abode there and live faithfully, you can see the crown of life that will be given at the end of time. My friends, whatever is the decision that you have come prepared today, let me ask you just one question before we sing the invitation song. Are you prepared to leave with the decision that you've made? If not, respond to him while we stand and while we sing. Hear the sweet voice of Jesus say, Come unto me, I am the standing for just a moment let me go over a couple of announcements may not be in the bulletin we do have a note here from uh, Melda uh, Melda Tip 
and uh, concerning her mom's uh, service. There will be a memorial service this coming Saturday, August the 26th. Be here at the building. They'll receive visitors from 1 until 2, and then the service will begin at 2 o'clock, and she expresses her thanks for all the love and prayers during this time. Ladies, there is a food list on the table in the foyer for uh, food for the family. And if you would like to look at that as we are dismissed this morning, you can be on the round table there in the foyer. As we noted in our uh, Bible class this morning, Ann Jacobson, she fell and she's bruised up pretty good. And that's the reason she's not able to be here with us this morning. And so we want to keep her in our prayers. Uh, Richard's mom will be having a heart cath uh, tomorrow, and uh, it's great seeing everybody here. I know we've, we may have some. Do we have anybody else that we need to add to our sick list this morning that we don't know about? If you do hear of anybody or if you contact anybody um, and they're not in the bulletin, then just uh, let us know. We'll be glad to get that information uh, to the rest of the congregation. There is an elders meeting this afternoon at 3 o'clock, so we'll be meeting here at the building at that time. No other announcements. We'll be dismissed in word of prayer. Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, as we approach our Heavenly Throne on this Lord's Day, we just thank you for the freedom that we have to come out and worship and sing praises into the holy and precious name. We thank you for Brother Clifford's lesson on the decisions that we the decisions that we make in our life will be a lifetime decision, dear Heavenly Father. We just make, we pray that we make the right one. We ask you to be with us as we depart and bring us back tonight. In Christ's name, amen.